Hi guys, this is Jason Zak from Nathaniel School of Music. So we asked our loyal subscribers, hopefully like you watching this, if you're not, then try to become one. We asked you all to shoot your questions. Now these questions ended up being absolutely amazing. I had a lot of fun going through them. I didn't expect so much of variety from all of you. And thanks for that, by the way. The questions were very insightful and I had to prepare a bit to answer them, to be uh, completely honest. So let's get down to it. So let's feature all of you who've asked the questions. I don't think I've missed out any. And do stay tuned to our channel for a lot more such polls and posts where we are going to get you folks, our subscribers, to be part of our YouTube videos in some way or the other. This is hopefully just the start of many more things to come. So we've got questions on technology. We've got questions on piano practice. We've got questions on music production. We've got questions on some theory topics some rather uh, rare ones we've got a few on rhythm so let's just figure them out one by one and see how it goes so first off we've got a question from destination ohm have you done an exercise on playing all major scales together and all minor scales together as a means of daily practice i want to develop a daily practice so i remember all well and good beyond this i am interested in pentatonic blues scales and apart from that if you have come up with a method for scale drills that would be great Wow, that's a very good question. Thanks for that. So I can break this down pretty quickly for you. If you start with a five note system, let's say the C scale, just these five notes, C, D, E, F, G. And now what you could do is these are the major scale notes. Now your question was you wanted to bring in minor. Why not we bring in everything else? So something I like to do pretty often on the piano would be to just plant my five fingers down on the first five notes of, let's say, the major scale, in this case, the C major. And then you have, you keep two notes consistent, the root and the fifth. And everything in between that could be played around with. So you could have your major second to be either here or you could play a minor second or you could play a augmented second. So you have two three kinds of seconds come to think of it you can do you can do that becomes a very spanish or a phrygian dominant sound then you can do where you have a sharp 2 so whole story flat 2 minor second major second Okay, that will be a sharp 2 or an augmented 2. Then you can mess with the 3rd. The 3rd could either be major 3rd, minor 3rd or even diminished 3rd. Some of you might be thinking, what is a diminished 3rd? Diminished 3rd is nothing but flattening the major 3rd twice. So, flat once, flat twice. Okay, so you could do play around with the 3rds and the 2nds. So, you'll get 6 permutations, right? Without any repetition of pitches and... Uh, they would be that would be you could call this as re 1 or ma minor 2 you could call this as diminished 3 or uh, g 1 in Carnatic music then maybe you can keep the same re and go to g 2 or minor 3rd sa re ga ma pa ma ga re sa or normal major third so you have three drills in there already okay then you can play around with your second uh, your second now can drift towards the major second and you can do your minor drill your major drill then you can move this to the augmented second you get only a major third because you can't go down uh, then you can mess with the four the four could either be the perfect four or the augmented four so we can do things like major or augmented four or we call that as lydian so you can put all this together and develop something cool as an exercise which could sound interesting as well get all those permutations in, right? I like that. 
get pretty much all the options so you can start with any five notes from a scale that you know like major and then mess with them keeping two notes as an anchor hopefully that will get you started we we'll leave a couple of other scale exercises in our description for further study thanks for your question next question from magali juvia sorry if i pronounced your name wrong but it's a great question thanks for that best everyday routine practice for 60s adult beginners well i am going to try and solve this for pretty much any uh, adult beginner so w- by an adult i generally think that adults have a challenge compared to kids and youngsters in the sense that we have to manage a family we have to work not a lot of us are doing music full time we have other commitments you know so what you need to do first of all is just ask yourself if you are a disciplined person or a crazy person like me in the sense if you are a disciplined person what will happen is you will have a calendar and you will really stick to that schedule of the calendar while if you are a kind of a crazier person or a more instinctive person like me who will practice if ever i practice i am not going to leave the piano i'm going to stay there for i don't know it could even be 10 hours i, I we we tend to not count the time now what i would recommend for a, a wider variety of people who i've taught is to have a combination of both start with a plan so the plan could probably be i want to practice in the morning for about an hour don't make it too specific don't say it has to be 7 to 8 am unless you are going to really stick with the schedule so what i like to do is i will just say i have to practice this amount of time or this is the amount of time i have make a list of five or six things you have to do over not that day's practice because that will put too much of pressure on you rather give it a weekly goal or even give it a monthly goal there's no harm in monthly goals i don't like yearly goals things like new year resolutions end up being my worst enemy because it's too far fetched one year is a lot of time so one month is good one week is good one day becomes too much of sort of cash memory moving up and down so it's too much of stress on the brain so when you do get the chance to practice whatever you have written down the challenge will be you'll play it and then you'll start getting pretty frustrated uh, worst case you'll you'll be like oh i can't i can't get it it's not happening so now when you get down to practicing once you've set a plan and you've b- prepared a list of things to do over that particular one hour what tends to happen to some people including me is you start with the drill and then it just goes nowhere because your mind is not as i say in the zone it's not wired to play uh, music so to speak it needs to kind of get warmed up just like a sport you need to stretch your muscles in music it's not only stretching your muscles you have to also get your brain to be wired to practice as i call it be in the zone so <clears throat> what you could do then is give the first 10 minutes to something spontaneous or like i say give the first 10 minutes to music don't come with a plan don't expect the piano to do what you want it to do just play just play for the love of playing uh, however don't play what you already know or what you played yesterday don't play your favorite song don't don't do a feel good kind of session in the beginning i don't like to play something which i feel very chill and comfortable about because then if you have to do something challenging your mind is already kind of fatigued and your mind is or lazy you know is another word i would use so start with something very challenging so if you don't get in the zone what i would recommend is this works for me this is my secret if you want to call it that when i practice i have a cell phone which most of us do and we turn a recorder app on it could be voice memos and the fact of me seeing that just tells me that okay you cannot just fool around and do some nonsense you shouldn't just play what you already know because you already know that so it puts you in a zone to either play something new be creative or push yourself to the next limit okay and at the end of your practice session perhaps do something 
which is feel good. Maybe play your favorite song. Do something which you were working on yesterday. And f- the routine is basically, in simple words, a process. It's not about the result. You should never think about the final goal, which is maybe recording that song or performing that song. It should always be about the process. So the process is I have to put in this amount of time to feel very relaxed and confident before I actually have to get my work out there or prepare the final video or perform the concert on stage. Hope that answered your question and gives you a motivation to check out a detailed video on how A practice routine can be developed. We've done a YouTube video already. Check out the description. Thanks for your question. Okay, so now for some technical questions. People have asked various questions on buying a piano, some brands which I might suggest and so on and so forth. So first off, Diren Oza asks, if I have Roland DS Juno 61, why the sound is not as good as yours? Do I seriously need to buy backup sounds to play in Indian instrument sounds? And then you say two-hand coordination. So I'm not going to talk about two-hand coordination because that's too much for this question. So I'll focus on the uh, keyboard question. So why the sound is not as good as yours may be debatable. Maybe your sound is actually good, but you're listening to the sound using maybe inferior listening equipment. Maybe the output is not so good. Maybe you need to invest in better headphones. Maybe... Uh, you would want to connect your keyboard to a basic speaker system to actually hear how it sounds. So some keyboards will have an existing speaker system. So you can hear your sounds off that. But that speaker is obviously a very, very simplified version of how the audience is going to hear you at a final concert. Because those speakers will be a lot more powerful with higher uh, uh, wattage, right? So these are just for home practice. So don't judge your sound just purely based on the output coming from the speakers and your headphones. You might want to check all that. So what we do in our music studio called the Nathaniel Production House is we send my keyboard as MIDI to the computer. We use a lot of processing. First of all, we use virtual instruments like Piano Tech, Keyscape and a few more from time to time which I like. So what happens with these virtual instruments is they keep getting upgraded from time to time and the sound will keep getting better and better. And the one I use more often for our YouTube videos is called Piano Tech. You can check it out. It's by the company ModArt. And it's not just about the piano. Then it's about what processing you're doing. There's equalization, there's compression, there's final mixing and mastering. So there's a lot of work which goes on behind the scenes in a studio environment. So maybe that's why my patch sounds better than yours. And coming to your question on backup Indian instrument sounds, I always like to be independent from the keyboard when I'm trying to get new sounds. So I would prefer to invest in VSTs or virtual instruments, find a few free ones out there, or maybe even get a pack like the native instruments contact is out there and you'll have a lot of manufacturers which have a bunch of samples together like uh, even spectrosonics has omnisphere which i use sometimes so get a pack which you can afford and more often than not that will also be sure to have indian instrument sounds like tabla kanjira violin sitar veena and so on then Rajarshi Kar asks, between Yamaha Roland and Cog, which one product in the segment of workstation synthesizer do you prefer most and what are the reasons for that? Well, it all to me, first of all, boils down to feel the, the touch bed or the key bed of your keyboard because I don't tend to bother much about the sounds on my keyboard. I go primarily MIDI because I'm also a live musician. I play shows across the country. So if I have to take this Roland or a Yamaha, which I buy, imagine taking that in a, for you Indians, you know, and in an Indigo flight, for instance, 15 kilo limit, they are going to throw it around. No one's going to care about your keyboard they're going to treat it horribly so why bother buying something just for the brand just for all of that focus first on how it feels on your hands on your fingers so first of all for me personally i want a graded hammer action feel so what happens is the low keys have a different feel or a weight and the high keys have a different weight you'll find that it's a bit easier to play high and it's a bit 
harder to play low because the weight is a bit heavier here. So get something which is weighted, graded because that's how a real piano is. It should have sustain pedal compatibility and not just a switch sustain. It should have a proper sustain pedal in the sense you should be able to press the pedal a little bit and it should sustain a little and then fully. So there's a level of sustain. That also for me is a deal breaker if that keyboard doesn't have one, you know. Uh, also, I don't like keyboards with too many knobs and uh, things like that because it's a bit scary if one of those were to get busted. You may not know which pad is busted, which fader is gone. Getting service is very tough, at least in India. And even if you get things serviced, how long it will take you? You'll have to ship it to them. That costs money. So why not get something with just keys, which can be fixed very easily by your local tech and leave all those knobs and bells and whistles out of the way and rely on software. So to answer your question... A Yamaha feel is awesome. Roland feels are awesome. Cogs are awesome. So I don't know which is better, but you need to know you need when it's not brand based. It's about what features the keyboard has or the what features the digital piano has that you need for your work. For me, if I have to break this down, I need something, first of all, which is light for my local gigs. I need something, as I told you earlier, graded hammer feel. Very important for me to play. I need to feel the keyboard or the keys almost hitting me back. I want that weight, that force to come back at me. That's how I've been trained. I can't play on those light, plasticky keyboards. It doesn't work for me. So th these are my preferences. And then from a technical aspect, you should check the MIDI compatibility, uh, integration with the computer. You should check the output of the audio. Obviously, there'll be a headphone out, LNR, mono, but you may want to check some other features. Maybe you want to uh, be able to connect a microphone into your keyboard just to sing. I don't want that feature, but maybe that's for you. Maybe you want something which is Bluetooth uh, powered. Maybe you want something which is battery powered, like the Yamaha CK88 is battery powered. Uh, however, the Roland RD88, which I have now, is very light, so I can take it for a gig easily. But every keyboard, for some strange reason, has something annoying about it, which I don't know why that exists. There's never been the perfect keyboard for me. Like the one with the best feel will be super heavy, so I can't have it around me. Or... For example, this Roland RD88 feels really good, but the pitch wheel is so useless, to be completely un honest. There's no feeling in that pitch bend. The, the pitch bend for a keyboard player, it's like a guitar player, you know, with the whammy bar, with the bending of the strings. There's a lot of artistry in that. Uh, you know, and we guys are not going to give that much expression as a violin player or a guitar player, but we try hard. But then if Roland or these some of these brands give us absolutely crappy pitch wheels like the one I have, but that was a compromise because I needed something light. So these are the decisions you would make. Don't go by brand, go by features in simple words. Thanks for your question. Am I Music 028 us? I do own a keyboard which doesn't have weighted hammer actions as well as it only has 61 keys, PSR E473. And I don't have the money to buy a digital piano. So is it possible to learn to be able to play like you using my instrument or is it necessary to get a hammer action? Very good question. So you need to look at what you can do at the moment. So for example, if what you can do is to maybe play simple accompaniment patterns like, you know, just stay around about four to five octaves of the piano and if you're accompanying in a band you know there's no problem having a 61 key to be completely honest however if you're a solo pianist if you if you want to do a lot of sustained pedal usage where you want to stride you want to lift your hand and come there and play the higher register lower register for different dynamics yes you would need a minimum of 76 to ideally 88 keys and inevitably the 61 keys don't have that weighted action i've not found any 61 key keyboard which has weighted you know, hammer action if you find one maybe you can let me know in the comments that would be interesting to consider so 
the other thing to consider is look at the cost over time you know eventually if you need a digital piano after about couple of years then you will have to then you've already spent for this 61 key so might as well look at a long term investment and like i said buy the simplest digital piano out there maybe a yamaha p45 would be good it, and that rivals some 61 key MIDI controllers, for example, Nectar, M Audio, and uh, Arturia, all of those have so many knobs. Their keys are horrible. I don't like the keyboard feel of almost any MIDI controller. But then it costs so much. Why do they charge so much? So those MIDI controller guys are charging almost as much as a digital piano. So if you're in that price market, or if you're in that range, then you might as well buy the digital piano, which will also have MIDI. So you can plug a cable to your computer, USB or MIDI cable. So look at what you want. Look at maybe long term, a long term decision. I know it's a tough decision. Uh, I tend to wait a lot before I buy a piano because I research a lot. I like to go to the store, play it. I like to read a lot of reviews, watch a few YouTube videos. So all the best with your decision. And then we have a question from a rather long username on YouTube. I don't know how they allowed you such a long name. Thanks, Jason. At which age did you start learning piano keyboard? Now, this is something I don't think I've ever told on the YouTube channel. I've learned piano, yes, a few lessons which my mom would have forced me to learning. Uh, we tried getting myself into some of these grades, but... Through my school, I was more into sports. But to my luck, a lot of my family members were very proficient, professional, experienced piano players, organ players, teachers, conductors, composers. So it I didn't really need to learn. It is more like honing your craft by just watching and observing your family members or your close uh, loved ones do their thing. So... I don't know when I started learning, but my mom tells me that I used to sit on my grandfather's lap at about the age of three or four, and he used to sort of get my hands aligned. But my memory is actually in the church uh, during uh, a lot of choir uh, performances, practices, and so on, where I used to sit near my mom or granddad and watch them play and I used to always enact sort of almost without anyone watching me but I used to quietly enact and do what I would call now as air piano so I think doing a lot of air piano is the first thing I remember actually getting down to learning the piano just trying to mimic them in the air trying to play the four-part harmony there and Strangely enough, that worked for me. I think it trained my ear more than anything because I could get all the parts down. And then among, with my peers, I remember playing the piano with people only from my uh, 11th and 12th grade where, again, it happened by accident. There was this a cappella group, a cappella you may know, where people don't use instruments. We just sing. So in that a cappella group, people myself included we were very pitchy so we were always uh, uh, in doubt whether we'll be able to perform the show without anyone throwing anything at us so we needed a guy who could kind of give notes and that was me so as it turned out I then started giving notes then it moved into chords then I started playing for a few bands and then a lot of bands so for me my training has come by my main learning I would say my main professional learning has never been in a school or any um, sort of examination environment. It's always my my teachers have always been musicians around me. And it's not a great thing to say, but I've not learned much from other pianists or keyboard players because in a band, you just have one keyboard player for the most part, at least in those days. So my main teachers were drummers, singers, guitar players, violin players, and uh, Indian musicians, flute players, so many of them, veena players. So I've learned a lot from musicians around me, and I've been lucky to play play for them for, for many years. So, so hopefully that gives you some insights into my journey as a musician.
Right, so Dr. Platypus Man asks, cool name by the way, I have many piano song books. Usually the singer's melody is shown with a treble clef and some chords are in the bass clef. But because I like to sing the songs myself, I'm not sure what I should be doing with the right hand. Good question. What I'd really like to learn is techniques for faking a song when only given the chords. Okay, I don't know what you mean by faking the song because your question is more to do with when you are singing the songs yourself. So then when you are singing or when someone else is singing, you are now functioning as an accompanist. So I would suggest focus on accompaniment basics. For example, playing the root notes of each chord of the progression in your left hand and the chords in the right hand. But don't just plonk them down. You need to play it in some kind of a rhythmic way. So focus on your rhythm. And get some basic patterns which can allow you to sing alongside these piano patterns. So don't simplify the pattern. First get the pattern and then practice singing something over this so na 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 so get maybe a basic ballad pattern like this focus on one arpeggio a couple of these default templates which you can use for a lot of songs and maybe some dancey patterns Maybe you're focused on a genre like reggae or blues. So you might want to focus for accompaniment patterns for those specific genres rather than just learn a general array. But definitely focus on some basic patterns. We've done a lot of accompaniment lessons. So we leave a, a few in the description. Check them out. So we have another question from Miracle, one of our enrolled students at Nathaniel. We also put it out for some of them. How to find the key of the song? What techniques needed to figure it out? So the key is different than the scale. The key is basically the tonal center. It, it would be, end up being one of the 12 notes in music. C, C sharp, D, E flat, E, F, F sharp, G, A flat, A, B flat, B. It will end up being one of those. So the key of the song would mean which is the tonal center, which should be the root. It doesn't necessarily mean the scale. It doesn't mean is it major or minor. So what I like to do is if I'm, you can do this in many ways. You can start off with a trial and error way. You can listen to the song, which I can't play in this YouTube video. Otherwise, our videos tend to get taken down. So you could just experiment one by one, trial and error with all these notes chromatically, but repeat them and play them in the song. So for example, if you do... Uh, you know, ta na 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 So that's your root of this particular song. But if you were whacking C sharp, ta na 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 na, see, it sounds absolutely wrong. So you would know when you a do an A B comparison between your piano and the actual song that is playing, which is the note which is awesome or great for the whole melody or the whole song which is the note or notes that are okay for the song and which are the notes which are hor absolutely horrible so there would end up being if you look at it if you look at the scale ecosystem there are usually seven notes in every scale right so three would be very awesome that would be the root the fifth and the third and by figuring out the third, you'll know if it's major or minor scale. The third could be a major third or a minor third. Major, minor, right? And the other notes would be kind of okay, not so great. It'll be like bridge notes or anticipations. Major second, perfect fourth, major minor seventh, or if it's a major scale, major seventh. These would be okay. Major sixth kind of works but they'll end up being five notes which sound absolutely wrong with the song like maybe your minor second uh, and your tritone but then 
the thing is your question is how do you find the key you may have found the key but you may not have found the scale so you need to then go through the trial and error process make three columns of awesome okay and horrible and then the awesomes and the okay three will be awesome four will be okay they gang up and they form the scale because three plus four equals seven and a scale ends up having seven notes correct so that's one way to get started you can head over to our members only section we have the opportunity to play actual songs and do this with the song in our year training course segment so do consider checking that out at the earliest dr john asks a very interesting question how to quickly shift chords while playing a song so i think to shift quickly shift chords do not get trapped in playing chords in only root positions if you do c major f major g major there's too much of jumping around isn't it c f g f c focus on playing chords without your eyes so you need to know inversions invest a lot of time knowing your inversions and then i guess your question may not be how to shift quickly it's probably more how to shift effortlessly so first off no eyes allowed so second off learn and master your chord inversions write them down and then practice slowly don't practice quickly practice slowly and last but not least practice in a real world environment probably practice with a drum backing track so that you know whether your timing is off or not off you know you you don't want to do the first chord then take your own sweet time and play the second chord so a drum backing track can help you shift pretty well okay hope that answers your question right so thanks for your questions we'll pause this part for now stay tuned for part 2 where we continue on a lot more interesting questions on production ai how to get gigs and also some more theoretical questions so do stay tuned for part 2